Welcome to Planning, Management, and Leadership for Health IT, Purchasing and Contracting. This is Lecture B, Evaluation Process. The objectives for this lecture, Evaluation Process, are to understand when to employ some of the most common tools of the trade for evaluating and selecting software, learn about evaluation aids and how they can affect an evaluation project, and understand some of the accounting basics for software purchases. Many great ideas, projects, etc. may have started out as a hallway conversation or on the back of a cocktail napkin, but at some point a formal process was initiated to carry it through to a successful conclusion. To use an old cliché, if you don't know where you're going, how will you know when you get there? Every evaluation and selection project must have a formal process to ensure that you and your team have performed an adequate level of due diligence and forethought before signing a contract. The degree of due diligence will vary based on the level of complexity and financial risk afforded by the proposal. Let's move on to a few more tools of the trade. Educational demonstrations are a good way to begin the requirements definition phase of a selection process. These types of demonstrations can be helpful for getting to know a few of the vendors in a particular field and serve to give the selection team a brief overview of the company and its products. Each demonstration should be no more than a couple of hours in length and provide the vendors an opportunity to explain how their software works. It is recommended to have these demonstrations from different vendors as close together as possible so the team can more easily compare the functions of one system to those of another. Educational demonstrations should not be used as the basis of system selection. As the name implies, these are for educational purposes only. Besides educational demonstrations, Formal requests for written documents may also be considered. The first of these documents is a request for information, or an RFI. This document is also a good way to educate a selection team on particular vendors' strengths and weaknesses. This is a short-form deliverable. A deliverable, in this case, is a document the vendor must produce, providing information about the company. Again, it is not something to base a selection on by itself. It is an opportunity for the selection team to gather data, learn who the vendors are in the market, learn more about their technical architecture, but also to get an idea of the size of the company, who their partners might be, the strength of the company, and general information facts. The next tool is a request for quote. Many times a request for quote, or RFQ, will be put out in order to determine budgeting targets. If a project has to be put in the budget for a coming year, many times the selection team will put together a request for quote. This is a request for some general budget information without a lot of details. This will be sent to the interested vendors, simply asking for budgetary figures. A request for proposal, RFP is for larger, more complex IT acquisitions. This process is a valuable way to improve offers and to also ensure that you're getting an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between vendors. Normally, an RFP is prepared for one of the following reasons. A large amount of money is involved in the transaction. There is a complex business or technical need so that the vendor choice is not obvious. And there are multiple vendors to be considered who have similar products. It helps to get competitive bidding for pricing service levels and products. Most, if not all, government organizations have procurement requirements that dictate the use of an RFP to ensure the organization is getting the most functional system for the money. A quick bid is generally used in hardware purchases for routine equipment. Many times organizations will put out quick bids for PCs, printers, and the like. They are not highly technical. 
Generally, they are put together with the specifications that you are looking for in that device, and requests are sent out for a bid. A sole source document is another way to request a deliverable. This is used primarily in those organizations where an RFP is required. At times, there are software packages or hardware that only one vendor can provide. Or, if you already have a substantial investment in a vendor and need to continue adding modules to their products, you may be able to fill out a sole source document to satisfy the organization's need for an RFP and still use the vendor you need. Different organizations will have their own model for a sole source document. The last is a catch-all bucket. It is an organizationally defined request. As mentioned before, every project should have some formal process for gathering data, evaluating vendors, and documenting the costs and the resources required should the purchase take place. Each organization has the leeway to design a process that best fits their organization, the size of the project that they are looking to embark upon, the complexity, and the finances. Again, as mentioned before, a large amount of resources, time, and effort are not required to be expended on small purchases. On the other hand, large, complex, risky projects will require large amounts of human resource hours, large amounts of due diligence, and many times a month's long process to get to selection. As you are continuing down the evaluation process, there are several aids that should be discussed and that will help you in your selection to gather the requisite data. These are customer reference calls, using a network of peers, conducting site visits, and having scripted demonstrations. Customer reference calls are an excellent means to discover how vendors and their applications are performing in installed client sites. Calls to existing customers are an inexpensive and less time-consuming method to evaluate the performance of a vendor and their applications. Calls should be made when researching products, regardless of size and complexity. In order to get the most value out of a call, you should be prepared with an agenda and a list of standard questions to be asked during each customer contact. Through these customer contacts, you may be able to establish a relationship with other customers who can provide you with information that is valuable to you during the contract negotiation and or implementation phases of the project. Additionally, you've identified a list of people to call post-contract when you have questions or concerns at a later date. Similar to customer calls, site visits to installed customers and to the vendor's corporate headquarters are a means to evaluate a vendor and their product. For a large purchase, it is extremely important to take a site visit or two to a currently installed user of a particular system you're looking to purchase. When picking a site to visit, be sure to find one that is as close a model to you as you can find. Typical questions to ask are, what is the size and complexity of the organization? If you are with a teaching or research facility, you should find an organization that is similar to yours in that regard. Similarly, if you are a small physician practice, you should find a site similar to your own to visit. What version of the software are they currently running compared to which one the vendor is proposing? And how large is the IT shop that supports this application? If possible, during the site visit, try to get unsupervised time with the customer. Granted, this may be difficult to arrange, but it's likely to be the only time you can get the unvarnished version of what life is like with Vendor X and or their application. A vendor corporate site visit can also be a valuable opportunity to learn more about the vendor's culture and where they are heading strategically. It gives you an opportunity to meet with a variety of individuals, from engineers to help desk or support staff members to thought leaders, and, depending on the situation, the top executives. 
this can be a valuable way to gauge the financial viability of a vendor as well. Obviously, the larger vendors in the market will have the funds to develop customer reception areas that border on being opulent. But when dealing with small vendors just starting out, you can learn a lot by just looking around the office. In some cases, you may just want to make sure that they have an office and not a garage behind their parents' house. As discussed earlier, when selecting vendors, your network of peers is an excellent resource for researching a vendor and their products. Be sure to include their experiences in your decision-making process, but also make sure that you are looking to purchase the same application as your peers are running. Earlier, the concept of an educational demonstration as a means of learning about various vendors was introduced. Scripted demonstrations are different in both scope and formality. Scripted demonstrations should be scheduled once the evaluation process has been narrowed down to two or three products. Unlike educational demonstrations, which are cursory reviews of a product, scripted demonstrations target the specific functionality desired by the customer. Demonstration scenarios should be well thought out by the evaluation team to cover the workflow and specific functions of a product. Each vendor should be expected to follow the script and not be allowed to deviate from any portion of the script. An effective script should walk a vendor's sales team through typical and not-so-typical situations in which their software will be expected to function. For example, the evaluation of a laboratory system should start with the registration of the patient, continue through the ordering of a test, the communication of this order to the lab, the performance of the test, and the communication of the result back to the unit, as well as to the ordering physician. Obviously, there should be more detail than that, but you get the picture. Walk the vendor through your expected scenarios and let them know you'll be evaluating them on that from the outset. By providing the same script to each vendor, you will have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of the products. Additionally, vendors will not have the flexibility to play down some of the less functional aspects of their product while focusing on the stronger points. While the purpose of this presentation is not to get deeply into the accounting business of a software selection, we do want to introduce you to some higher-level financial concepts as they are important parts of any evaluation and selection process. Obviously, you will have some budget requirements set by the organization before you go out to evaluate a product or select software. Once you have the budget requirement defined, it is generally broken down into a couple of different buckets, capital expenses and operating expenses. Under capital expenses, some of the more common items are hardware, software, fees if you purchase the license, and any services or consulting that you contract for which will be either by the hour or, in some situations, you could have a flat rate or a fee-for-service arrangement. One thing many people forget when budgeting for services and consulting are the travel expenses. By the nature of the work, consultants fly in most of the time, stay in hotels, eat dinner, rent cars, and do all sorts of things that generally get charged back to the budget of the project. Make sure that in your negotiations and discussions with the vendor that you do your best to limit travel expenses and, if possible, have them abide by the travel policies of your own organization. Training can be a little complicated at times. You can capitalize the development of training materials, meaning the time that someone spends developing the training materials. And you can capitalize the time of the trainer as part of the process. We will talk a little bit more about the operating side of training later in this lecture. As we enter into the operating expenses bucket, software can be considered an operating expense as well. If you purchase a license to install the software on your system, 
that is not normally part of operating expenses. However, if you are having the vendor provide the software for your systems remotely, such as in a software-as-a-service model, it is more of a subscription fee. Maintenance and support fees after go-live are operating expenses. As we said in the introduction, maintenance and support fees generally run between 15 to 20 percent of the original purchase price. You should expect 20 percent when you budget and try to negotiate down from there. Remember, when paying 20 percent a year in maintenance and support for software, you will have, in effect, repurchased that software in five years. So you need to make sure that the due diligence that you perform is adequate and that the system that you have selected will meet your needs. On the operating side, training and staff should be included. Remember, you can capitalize the development of materials and the actual time for the trainers, but you cannot capitalize the training of staff. So, if you have a large EMR rollout where nursing has to go through a half day or full day of training, you will need to build the overtime pay into the project budget that will be needed for the staff to go and get trained. Leasing is an option for hardware. Many times an organization would rather lease the hardware than capitalize it. It is an accounting decision generally for large hardware. You also see leasing of PCs from time to time, which is beneficial in that you can generally get a refresh of equipment every two or three years through a lease. However, you have to be prepared to budget as an organization a steady stream of PC replacements for as long as the lease runs, instead of capital purchases every so often. It is extremely important to truly understand the total cost of ownership when preparing to purchase a software product. The previous slides have provided an entry-level overview of what financial implications a long-term contract may have on your organization. Take the time to involve finance in the decision-making process and spend the time to document all costs to your organization, capital and operating. Typically, you will see organizations modeling these costs over a three to five year period of time to develop an accurate picture of what effect a decision to go with one vendor over another will have on the corporate or practice bottom line. This concludes Lecture B of Purchasing and Contracting. In summary, you have been exposed to some of the more common tools that IT business professionals use when conducting hardware and software evaluation and selection projects. As you have learned, each tool has its own specific function. During the course of a typical project, you may use several of these tools, each at different points in the process. You may only use one or two of these tools because the size and complexity will drive the utilization. Additionally, you always have the option of developing your own tools as well. Remember that any tools or aids you do choose to utilize should be used in a consistent manner and with each potential vendor in the process to gain the best chance of obtaining an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of various products. You may have heard the phrase from the not-for-profit world of healthcare, no margin, no mission. You're probably asking what this has to do with the closing portion of a software selection presentation. Well, as we've discussed previously, the purchase of a software product can be an expensive endeavor. Many times, vendors will sell a product based on their projection of its ability to provide your organization a return on investment, or ROI. At this point, we don't have the time to delve deeper into the appropriateness of a vendor's ROI calculations. But suffice it to say, these should be taken with a grain of salt and carefully considered before applying similar projections to your organization. <laughs>